Hey everyone, my name is Robert Crocker. Uh, we are down here at the Peterson Vault presented by Hagerty, a collection of over 250 of the timeless and priceless automobiles. And today we'll be looking at some of the modern day sports and supercars. So let's go inside and take a look. So hot on the heels of the recent Ford versus Ferrari movie that was just released last year. Uh, if you've seen the movie, you're familiar with the Ford GT40. This here is a 2005 Ford GT, or the spiritual continuation of the GT40, but you'll notice that the name 40 has been dropped from it altogether. That's because the original name, GT40, referred to two things, the 40 degree cant of the windshield, as well as the 40 inch overall height of the car. However, the name GT40 was patented by a company called Saphir Engineering, who then held the patent when this car was reintroduced. Uh, as a problem as well, it cost $40 million for Ford to repurchase that patent back from the company, and it was not a sum they were willing to pay. Not only that, but 40 inches of height was not what this car had, so they decided to drop the name altogether and leave it as just the Ford GT. This one in particular was meant to commemorate the centennial of the Ford Motor Company, and if you look at the driver's side headlight, you'll see that the headlight spells out 100, and that's a small little feature they added in instead of a plaque or some sort of reference to that. Uh, and as a result, it was alongside introduced with the Ford Thunderbird and the continuation of the Ford Mustang, which were also some of their heritage models. Next to it here, we have the 2017 Ford GT. This is a heritage edition, so it's been painted in a 50th anniversary uh, paint scheme commemorating the 1967 24 Hours of Le Mans win by a Ford Mark IV. There are a couple differences that you'll notice between this one and the previous generation Ford GT. First and foremost, if you look at the actual width of the car, it's just as wide, if not wider, but the cockpit width seems a lot thinner. This car takes one step further, or at least a couple steps further over the previous GT in terms of aerodynamics. Focused more on fuel efficiency and a minimal amount of drag on the car's body, you'll notice that it's got these two side tunnels that are carved into the car that come all the way to the rear and feed through the rear wing. The motor inside of this as well loses two cylinders but gains two turbos. It's got a V6 EcoBoost Ford twin turbocharged V6. Previously, the iteration that you see over there was using a 5.4 liter supercharged Ford V8 that would be found in something like the Ford SVT Mustang and the Cobra. This one though, the Ford designers decided that they were gonna drop the V8 because the V6 twin turbo on numbers uh, produces more power, more torque, better fuel efficiency, and it's also more compact overall. Weighs less, has a narrower cross section. As a result, they were able to kind of keep the center line of the car very thin. Uh, the paint scheme on this car in particular is a slight upcharge of, I believe it was somewhere north of $10,000. Uh, not only because of the paint, but also because of what it represents. It's a very important piece of Ford's history and they're not gonna just tack that on for a small price. Also look at the size of the brakes for this car. To keep it from uh, getting too fast through the corners, you've got these large discs that are provided by Brembo, as well as these six pot calipers, uh, front and rear. So many of the cars down here in the Peterson vault are actually maintained in running condition. So at any time, you could actually get inside and fire one up, if you're allowed to. Uh, luckily, we have been permitted to fire up this Ford GT today uh, to give an example of what it sounds like with that V6 twin turbo EcoBoost engine. There we go. It's quite comfortable in here, very tight fit. Beautiful piece of engineering as well as a beautiful set of sounds. Look at that. Moving along down the line here, we have kind of jumping back in time just a little bit, a 1956 Jaguar XKSS. Uh, this particular car here was owned by Steve McQueen who purchased it for $5,000 in 1957. He was the third owner and it was originally painted white with red interior. This particular car here uh, is quite important for a number of reasons. The XKSS was more or less the homologated road-going version of the Jaguar D-Type. 
That car was so dominant at races like Le Mans and in the World Sports Car Championship that Jaguar decided that they were going to leave in 1956 before being outregulated. As a result, the remaining D-type chassis were then converted into road-going cars, which are now known as the XKSS. 25 were scheduled to be built, however only 16 ended up being built because the original Browns Lane factory for Jaguar in England burned down with the remaining nine continuously built uh, or semi-finished XKSS chassis. It's got a 3.4 liter straight six engine producing somewhere just around 250 horsepower uh, and is also quite a bit of a speed demon back in the day, easily reaching speeds of over 150 miles an hour. This one here is uh, painted in British racing green with that black leather interior to kind of commemorate the national racing color of England, the British racing green. And if you take a look next to it, we jump forward about five years uh, to a 1961 Series 1 Jaguar E-Type. There's quite a bit of difference between these two cars, the D-Type or the XKSS and the E-Type, predominantly in the body shape. While the XKSS kind of presents a more 1950s philosophy of car design, you move forward into the 1960s with the E-Type. This one here, also with the 3.4 liter inline six engine, uh, is kind of the pinnacle flagship of Jaguar sports cars starting in the early 1960s. And this particular chassis here has undergone a 5,000 hour restoration. So if you kind of see the inside, everything looks like it's brand new, as it would have appeared from the factory in 1961. Now coming back behind the Jaguar, we have a line of three different Ferraris. Also very uh, important models here to note for the modern Ferrari lineup. We start here on the end with a 2011 Ferrari 599 GTO. The GTO moniker for Ferrari has long since been a reference to the homologated road-going versions of their race cars. That being said, this particular car traces its lineage back to the early 1960s with the Ferrari 250 GTO, which also happens to share the same overall layout. Front mid-engine, or a proper Grand Tour, with a V12 engine up in the front uh, and rear wheel drive. This particular car here was, according to Ferrari, the fastest uh, road-going production car that they built in that year, with a top speed of over 220 miles an hour and a power output of 661 horsepower. This one here as well is more or less a road-going version or the equivalent of the 599XX, sharing some components with it, including a exhaust system that was derived from the uh, 599XX, a special track-only edition car that was built by Ferrari. Next to it, if you look, we have a different layout, mid-engine, V8, but also naturally aspirated. This is what they call the Ferrari 458 Challenge. It is a part of a one-make series that was hosted by Ferrari, or the Trofeo Pirelli, uh, that was based on the 458 road car. Now at this time, in the early 2010s, Ferrari had their GT2 program with the 458, which is a proper full-built race car, whereas this was more or less a converted road car from Ferrari. You'll see in the inside here that we have full race seats, full say belt uh, racing harnesses, a roll cage, as well as a number of different interior pieces that reflect its kind of track going use. This one here as well has got the upgraded brakes and the wheels that were fitted by Ferrari to help this car achieve its maximum potential on the racing surface. And as uh, one of the many ways that if you're a very enthusiastic Ferrari customer, besides buying the car, you can also race the car through Ferrari and help them to raise money for their sports car and Formula One programs, which is the mainstay of their uh, business. Next to it is the Ferrari F12, but this isn't just any old F12 or Berlinetta. This is a 70th anniversary edition F12, part of 70 cars that uh, were built by Ferrari to commemorate their 70th anniversary. This one in particular, to reflect that heritage, has a blue with the white stripe down the middle to commemorate a 1962 Ferrari 250 GTO that was driven by Phil Hill and Olivier Gendebien uh, in a race called the Coupes de Salon in Paris. Uh, more or less, the F12 Berlinetta is a continuation of the 599. It is the more modern variant. And uh, this one here, as I had mentioned, is number 35 out of 70. The other uh, 69 cars that Ferrari had built to commemorate the heritage included things like a Ferrari 488 GTB painted to, uh, to commemorate a Formula One car from the 1960s that was also mid-engine and V8 powered. Moving along down the line just a little bit further, we see here a 1992 pilot production Dodge Viper RT10. Introduced at uh, the uh, 1989 Motor Show in Detroit, we have the Chrysler Viper, which was the first American sports car to be powered by a quote-unquote big block V10 engine. Eight liters in size, the Viper would eventually get something up to 8.4 liters and were known for the tremendous heat inside of the cockpit initially. If you look inside the car here, there's not a whole lot of insulation that's uh, to be seen. 
And with the side exit exhaust pipes, there's a lot of heat coming off of the side of this car. Uh, it was a feature that you would see more predominantly on the Shelby Cobra from the 1960s, but was kind of revigorated by the Dodge Viper in the early 1990s. Dodge discontinued production of the Viper just about two years ago because they were always offered in manual transmissions. As sports cars grew and evolved and uh, learned to have the paddle shifters, Dodge stuck with the manual transmission, which was kind of a hard selling point if you plan on driving the car every day. But if you notice, it's got a very long hood because the engine inside of this takes up so much space. Later on, they started adding X cross braces to the engine uh, to help support the front from moving around so much from all that weight and torque that is produced by the eight liter V10. Two spots down, we have another very important sports car in the history of uh, not only sports cars, but also world records. It's a 1992 Jaguar XJ220. And as Jaguar goes, they typically named their models based on the top speed. So as you would assume, XJ220 would mean 220 mile an hour top speed. But that's not entirely true. In 1992, a completely unmodified version of the car, which is one of the criteria that you need in order to be, or to, uh, be officially recognized as the fastest production car, would not break 213 miles an hour at the hands of Martin Brundle, who was also a Formula One driver and one of Jaguar sports car factory drivers at that time. A little bit of the development history on the XJ220 was that initially it started off as more or less of a side project of a couple of Jaguar employees. Quickly they started to realize that it had some serious potential. Uh, they initially proposed it had an all-wheel drive system and also that it be fitted with a 6.2 liter V12 that was derived from Jaguar's Le Mans winning XJR sports cars at the time. However, for similar reasons to the 4 GT, the 2017 version, a V6 twin turbo engine was opted instead of the V12. Much more compact, doesn't drink as much fuel, and also uh, has a better power band on paper with the two turbochargers. So unfortunately for Jaguar at that time, it was not recognized officially as a top contender for the world's fastest production car, even though it did have the top speed briefly at 217 miles an hour. That extra four miles an hour were gained when Jaguar decided to opt for removing the catalytic converters in favor of a straight through exhaust. Uh, catalytic converters at that time were not mandatory in Europe for their smog or emissions laws. However, it wasn't the way that the Jaguar XJ220 came from the factory, so therefore it did not count as the world top speed record. Moving on down the line even further here, we have a collection of three different McLarens finished in the same strikingly beautiful but bare minimum carbon fiber finish. Uh, an interesting note, if you look at the badge of the McLaren up here, you can see that it is a little silver piece. Now that actually is a small little sheet of silver that's tucked between the gloss coat and the bare carbon fiber on the car. McLaren's obsession to detail uh, is exemplified right there because they know that a little piece of the silver sticking up would create even the most microscopic piece of drag. So to keep it minimal, they tucked it underneath the gloss clear coat to make the exterior surface as smooth as possible. This is a McLaren Senna, a tribute from the company to the legendary Ayrton Senna, a Brazilian Formula One driver who unfortunately uh, suffered a fatal crash in 1994 at the San Marino Grand Prix at Imola. He's very important to the McLaren history because he won three and all three of his Formula One World Championships with the company in 1988, 1990, and 1991. In the rear here, we have a wing that is what you would call active aero. On full throttle, the wing lifts down or drops down to help uh, minimize drag down a straightaway. But when the brakes are applied, the wing pops back up to help uh, create more downforce for the car to help it stop. Uh, in terms of actual design of the car, it is not the most aesthetically pleasing because uh, it's not necessarily built to look stylish. It just happens to be stylish because of the speeds it can achieve. Uh, this is the essential definition of unction over form right here. Um, and next to it, we have a McLaren P1. Introduced in 2012 at the Geneva Auto Show. This was the McLaren entry into what they call the hypercars. Uh, this one here fitted with a hybrid engine on top of the 600 horsepower twin turbo V8. Means that this car produces 900 horsepower when you combine those two figures together. You'll notice it has the same feature here, that McLaren, that piece of silver tucked underneath the gloss coating to keep drag at an absolute minimum. This one here also has a rear wing that pops up and lowers to uh, help with braking and downforce, but also to help with the top speed. Uh, this car here had direct competition from the Ferrari LaFerrari and the Porsche 918 Spyder. 
Later on, McLaren decided that this version of the car would not be enough, and they went on to produce the P1 GTR, which was an even more hardcore, track-focused version of this car that produced well over 900 horsepower, which much more uh, aggressive aerodynamics to it. Next to it, in the end of this row, we have the McLaren 688 High Sport, a car that uh, more or less was the most hardcore version of the 675 LT that you could purchase. This rear wing here uh, has active aerodynamics as well with a little brace that helps to lower and raise the wing to help with down, or downforce and top speed. You'll notice as well that there is a hood scoop on the top here to help with uh, engine intake and that it is finished as well in this full carbon fiber finish with a clear coat on top. All three of these cars have matching paint schemes and also have that bare minimum carbon fiber finish to them on the outside. Uh, it is built by McLaren MSO, or what they call McLaren Special Operations, which is a very prestigious and a high-end program that you have to, to uh, be invited to be a part of. But essentially what it is, is you get to be a part of the company's uh, future, helping them to shape their future models and also customize every aspect of the car that you purchase. So with this car here, we're going to end our little tour on the modern day sports and supercars, and I hope you enjoyed. Thank you very much.